University College presentation, and it's nice to have so many of you here. I know that many of you are connected with the University College as uh, program associates and graduate assistants, and you've been working the last day or so with uh, Lindsay in understanding more as you are preparing for teaching um, the research seminars this um, spring semester with the University College students. So that you, and we also welcome other guests that are here today that are going to be prospective uh, teachers in the University College and to our outside audience who will be interested in learning more about what the University College is and how they might be able to apply various principles or activities, the kinds of things that we experiment with in the University College and how that can be transferred across all disciplines across the University. I'm Sarah Minky fish I'm Director of the University College and a Professor in the School of Communication. And it's great to have you here today. This is a very informal <laughs> presentation. It's one in which we invite you to ask questions throughout if you have them. Uh, we'll also take questions at the end as well. But this is all about making the most out of your time and the experience that you're going to be having here today. I'd like to also introduce Jamie Wyatt, who is Associate Director of the University College, and she's a font of information and resource for everyone here uh, at the University. So let's uh, first take a look at the University College and uh, think a little bit about what is the, what is the U, UC. And um, so I'm going to play for you um, a short 30, 60 second video that just gives you an overview of what the University College is. And Angela, if you could kill the lights in the back. Um, we're having an audio transfer difficulty. I'm going to play the audio from my computer because otherwise all you're going to get is the audio, the backup audio from channel two. Uh, it's just not mixing quite properly. So uh, hopefully you'll be able to hear this. University College is a premier living, learning, and laboratory experience that builds collaborative communities for first year students. Well, the speakers in, I just want the speakers in the podium. No, not that. The speakers in the podium. All right. Right. Sorry. We'll put this presentation on hold. The University College is a premier living, learning, and laboratory the video that builds collaborative communities for first-year students. What this means is that UC students live together in Anderson Hall on a floor with four different cohorts. These could range from college writing to public health, visual literacy, or sustainable <laughs> earth. Hang on, we'll see why the video isn't coming up. <laughs> That's too bizarre. I know, and I, isn't, I it great that we, isn't it great when we work in film and media? Yeah, we have a pen <laughs> Exactly. Um, so, so the, yes, the first day you walk into the defense window and there's some structure on the other side. She has that. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The University College is a premier living, learning, and laboratory experience that builds collaborative communities for first-year students. What this means is that UC students live together in Anderson Hall on a floor with four different cohorts. These could range from college writing to public health, visual literacy, or sustainable earth. The master professionals who teach the UC classes are esteemed experts in their fields. 
They work to hand select the program associates, students who have taken the course before and now live on the UC floor, to help current UC students discover Washington, D.C. From the museum to Broadway shows, UC students get to experience more of Washington, D.C. and American University than the average student. With a variety of classes on each floor, you're guaranteed to be surrounded by a diverse group of people who share a passion for all things fun and interesting. So that gives you a quick overview because oftentimes people are asking, well, what is the university college and what kinds of experiences do the students have when they're there? And many of you, of course, have been very engaged uh, with the university college from its beginning or in particular working now as PAs and GAs with it so that you um, have a, a greater sense of um, what our goals are and the kinds of things that we're wanting to do. Uh, Stina um, is here to uh, speak with us a little bit about promoting engagement through linking your course to a Welcome Week program. Um, before I get started, I'm kind of curious as to who, because I don't know people who are here and what your involvement are, so yes. can we sort of figure out that way I have a sense of who's here. Like, do we have mostly UC people? Do we have PAs? Like, what's the mix? All right, so our PAs, raise your hands. Okay. Our graduate assistants, raise your hands, and they're the ones all working with spring uh, seminars. Okay. Um, professors, raise your hands. And professors that have never taught in the university college, uh, raise your hands. Great. Larry, okay? Okay. Um, so, I guess, a have you all been through a fall semester then? Larry Angel the has not. So one, okay. And he will be next fall in teaching visual literacy okay. in the University Maybe College. The you are. <laughs> <laughs> so the biggest thing that I would say in terms of the welcome week, the most important thing that I've discovered after I've taught UC for two semesters now, I teach in the college writing program, I teach the extremes class. Um, the biggest thing that I've noticed and the most important thing I think is that to realize that the students need to connect that welcome week to what's actually happening in the class throughout the semester. When that connection doesn't happen they don't really understand why they did the welcome week and it feels like an extra added on thing. So the way that I've been able to work that in my courses is through a lot of writing prompts and sort of getting them to see how those connections can actually work and also really thinking about what they're doing for their welcome week. Um, Another thing that I would also note, which won't be as helpful for the PAs and the PAs, is that um, one thing that's really helpful for me is to find out in my other classes, my non-UC classes, to find out who is actually UC and who isn't. Um, because a lot of times the kids who are in UC will have connections that will be helpful in your current classes. Um, so that's sort of a quick brief. The biggest thing, connect connect everything throughout the semester, including the labs, make sure they go back to the classroom and figure out how things work, otherwise students feel like they're doing work that doesn't make sense. And I would just dovetail that from a visual literacy perspective in the university college course that I've taught, uh, is getting them um, to really see Washington and get them out and exploring Washington as a laboratory. And where Stina's emphasis, of course, has been on the writing and seeing and doing things in Washington, Ours has been from a, a visual perspective. And I've done this for several years, and I would finally say that this year was the year that I had the most success. I think I finally got it right for the Welcome Week activities. And you know, that's part of teaching, is learning what uh, works and then adapting to uh, taking what does work and keeping it, moving it forward, and pitching what doesn't work. Um, so here's what worked. Um, again, in that whole idea of making sure that the students are really connecting, uh, we decided that we were going to view Washington this time with visual literacy from various perspectives. And so in addition to uh, in the first day where they went to the Library of Congress and got their Library of Congress cards and we had a wonderful tour and visually looking at the Library of Congress and making sure that the kids are at the very, very beginning starting to think about research and how they might use um, Washington, D.C. as their laboratory. Um, we had a wonderful visit there and an excellent tour. And then we, um, with my program associate who was phenomenal and graduate, uh, the teaching assistant who was in the course as well, the students had an opportunity to uh, go on, um, see Washington from several different perspectives and take visuals of that. So um, by foot, of course, then they went up to the post office tower, had a view of Washington from above ground, 
then they went on segways and had a segway tour of Washington, D.C., and got to see it on wheels and looking at it from there. And in the final day, um, they, they saw um, Washington from the water by doing the paddle boat. And all those activities also were team building along the way, loosening them up, getting them to start feeling comfortable with one another and break down any um, kind of fears they may have or, or getting to know one another. So that by day one, when we step in the classroom, I not only know their names and know uh, I know a lot about them, and they've had some phenomenal experiences together, so that we are really launching forward. Um, and I think that's been one of the best parts of having great Welcome Week activities, and ones in which really across the university are things that can be done not just in the university college, because we have Welcome Week activities and service learning projects taking place for, I believe, the Jamie's are close to 80% of the first year students participate in those um, yeah. in those activities so that all faculty really could think about ways in which they might engage students um, in Welcome Week activities. In talking about service learning, Kiho Kim. Good morning everyone. I'm, I'm Kiho Kim. I'm from the Department of Environmental Science. And I, I see some familiar faces from uh, my class. And so um, as part of the service learning component, we, we do the, the Welcome Week activities as well, but um, you can put those slides up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the things I try to do in the laboratory component, uh, especially for UC class, is to do laboratory experiments that provide some sort of benefit to not only uh, uh, the students who are taking the class, but also to, to the broader community on campus and even in some cases beyond. Uh, in the sciences, the, the service learning begins with a basic understanding of how science is done, and so as part of the regular laboratory instruction, they go out to, this is a, a set of pictures from the Potomac River where they're getting some ideas about how to measure various environmental parameters using uh, uh, various analytic tools. They even get to go out and into the middle of the Potomac to take water quality samples and things like that. And so we use this regular part of the class to develop some sense of the scientific process, which is a very sort of straightforward process of understanding how things work. And so you ask questions about how things work, and you devise experiments uh, to make that happen. And so we uh, use this as sort of a jumping point to the next slide, which is um, how to use this um, tool, which is what science is, to address questions that are important to a broader range of people. And so over the last couple of years, I've engaged the UC students into carrying out experiments that address a very specific need for the university. Uh, one of the first things that we did as part of the year-long university college uh, and this, this segues into the research component as well, is the idea that um, the university needs to have some sort of a stormwater management plan. And the reason why we need one is because the District of Columbia charges all residents of D.C. On, based upon how much hardscape that they have on campus. They, that, this is the space on which where rain falls and simply falls back into the stormwater drain. And that uh, provides a sense of how much the D.C. government has to pay to clean up all that water. Right? And so there's a, uh, uh, I think, you, I think a, you pay something in the order of about $240,000 a year based upon the amount of hardscape that we have. And so uh, we weren't really exactly sure about that. Nobody had actually carried out an inventory of the hardscape on campus. And so uh, working with Chris O'Brien in the Office of Sustainability, uh, you see the picture on the left, clicking out the screen. Uh, I, I sent the students out, I gave them some tools, I taught them how to use Google Earth, uh, use the actual, the actual analytic part of Google Earth, and have them uh, go out, uh, cord off various parts of the campus into various hardscapes, or softscapes, or soils and things like that, classify every square foot of the university campus using Google Earth, and then ground checking uh, their data from Google Earth. They measure all of the areas, and they're able to calculate how much hardscape and therefore the contribution of universities, uh, stormwater, and, and, and then based on that, develop some plans for stormwater management. Additional rain gardens, uh, places where you can cut the curb so that instead of running off into a storm drain, it drains into a place where it can be absorbed by, by the ground. And we can use this information, university benefits, because we can show that these are benefits by cutting parts of the curb, the university would get credit, so they wouldn't have to pay as much. 
Uh, and so one of the things that's coming out of all of this is that uh, I'm scheming up a plan to create a small wetland uh, right in front of Beasley Building, which will also reduce the amount of stormwater that goes into the drains. And this will be happening for the UC probably next fall. Fantastic. Fantastic. And one final thing, in this past year, um, the other thing that the university needed was uh, what are our faucets like, everything from shower faucets to, to kitchen faucets, are they efficient? And so I, these are just a few of the students uh, who were involved, but we went out and measured every single faucet on campus, mm -hmm. and toilets, and urinals, <laughs> <laughs> and the amount of water that they use for every flush. And um, having done all of that, uh, if you do the economic calculation, it turns out that if you replace all of the inefficient hardware on campus, everything from shower heads to toilets, it only take about six months for the university to recoup all of that cost. And we would be saving lots of money. And didn't you affect some change within the university because of your study? Yep, they have now a plan to, to <coughs> remove all those things. Okay. So through service and research yeah. and making a difference not only on campus but for the greater good of uh, um, the entire region. Yeah, so this was a, a very beneficial thing and it just students love it. And so should I segue into the research preparation? Yeah. Part? And so I just want to end by this idea of research preparation. For, for my class, it's not as difficult because this is something that they engage in right off the bat. But there are a few things that, for the PAs in particular, that I want you to sort of think about. The first, the most important thing is, what is the question that they're asking? And so research isn't just for science, it's for anything that we all engage in. What is the question that you want to address? Once you define the question, that's the hardest part. What is the question that you're trying to answer? If you can define that, then the methods by which you answer the question become self-evident. And you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Very often, the methods are already out there. And the beauty of science is that as long as you can record it and describe it and other people are able to repeat it, that's science. Right? You don't have to reinvent the wheel, as long as you're able to use the same methods and describe it to other people, and the results that you get is repeatable by other people, then you're fine. And so you don't have to worry about doing things the right way, as long as it makes sense to you, and long as it addresses the questions that you have, have on hand. And the final thing is expectations. Manage expectations. A lot of people think that doing science is really exciting, you get to pull things up in the laboratory, <laughs> Uh, that happens like 1% of the time. The remaining 99% of the time, you're out there schlepping buckets and looking at <laughs> toilets uh, on your knees and measuring water flow from, from, from various faucets. Really, really dull stuff. And so you have to manage those expectations. Otherwise, it's easy for students to become disillusioned about what this, whole, what, what, uh, what this is about. Uh, so you just have to make it clear that, yeah, this is kind of dull and mundane, but it addresses a very important issue. Well, I think when you think about managing expectations, that not only applies in the science classes, but it applies in all of our disciplines. Because when you see a final product, you may say, oh, wow, that was really great. That, oh, how fun. That all looks like so much fun. And they have no idea, for example, in a theater performance, how much time and research and thought goes into and hours and hours of time to making something that you watch for 90 minutes uh, look seamless and I easy and, and just so uh, fabulous that that's something that you want to do next. And with that transition, we'll go to Gail. Uh, Gail, uh, we're going to have you talk a little bit about incorporating scholarship into your course. Good morning. My background is theater, um, but I'm an academic mongrel because each of my degrees is in a different discipline. My undergraduate degree was history, my master's theater, and my doctorate focusing on educational psychology. And my presentation today, I'll go eight minutes if I can use my four, you can take four, eight minutes, much time as you um, consists of three parts. And I hope that you will understand it comes from my disciplinary perspective but think about how that can articulate to what you actually do. So the first part deals with my research that has, and, and publications, um, as well as artistic work in two different areas. So that's part one. Part two, how has that influenced the design and content of the current UC course that I've taught now for four years, it's been my pleasure, and the design of a new wild card. It gave me the courage to generate the design of a new course that's called Theater as Protest. And the third part, which I think will be um, the most exciting in some ways, is to share the student work 
the learning outcomes. Um, I have some poster boards from their presentations when they dealt with key research questions around Shakespeare. And then I have some slides from their finals when they became directors and analyzed plays and came up with unusual and unique presentations. The very last thing will involve non-threatening participation from all of you. It's a very short passage from Sophocles and Antigone. It's the final choral passage. And I'll give you an example of how we do some of the participation in class. Okay, so first, my work itself. So my research is in two areas, arts-based teaching and learning applied to any content area. And I work with a few current cognitive learning theories that I've applied into the design of the course. I've written a lot of articles about it and actually will have a book coming out in another year published by Intellect Books out of UK called Arts, Education, and Integration, the Teacher as an Agent of Change. And I'll throw that out to you to think about the responsibility of the teacher as an agent of change. There are three or four learning theories that are encompassed in my work, as well as some brain research. Let me throw them out very quickly to you. You may have heard this name, Howard Gardner, Theory of Multiple Intelligences. How many people are familiar with Gardner or have heard of Gardner? Great. He's designed, based on all of his research, what he thinks are eight entry points for knowledge. And then he has a one half, which is the existential, and we can discuss that. But what I have found is in every classroom, you find a dominant entry point from all of these intelligences. So that makes your challenge as someone who comes into a classroom dealing with diverse prior knowledge and various learning entry points significant. So I consider Gardner's approach. I consider Bruner. Anyone familiar with Jerome Bruner? He did the new math in the 1960s, constructivist learning theory. His outlook is discovery learning. And I will leave you with that manifestation as your final activity, discovery learning. See if you can do Greek theater. I won't teach you the classical Greek. That would be next step. You can learn it right after we did it. The third one is <laughs> Lev Vygotsky, and I think this is particularly appropriate for UC. And Vygotsky's outlook is that learning is situated socially, and that through your peers you will learn. But he also has another very interesting perspective. It's called the zone of proximal development. He says it is the teacher's responsibility to understand every student's zone. Where is their learning now? And how do you expand that zone? Which means, of course, you have to know every student in a lot of different ways. And, and I'll share with you some of the activities we do. Unit one is all about metacognition and the community of learners. How do you learn and think? And how do you function in a community of learners? Okay, part two is all theater in my focus. And it's theater to engender dialogue. I was a Fulbright scholar and lived in Prague and did a lot of work at the former ghetto concentration camp called Terezin. You might know it as Theresienstadt. Um, I wrote a chapter called Giving Voice to the Silenced through theater about my work. And I continue to work on the notion of theater to further social justice, to generate change. And I've used a great deal of that work in terms of the selection of the plays that I use, and certainly influenced the full content of the new course, Theater as Protest. And I'm doing Theater as Protest, contemporary theater only, I, I limited it, um, to look at theater that engenders difficult dialogue around race, class, gender, political, and social issues. The current course that I've taught is called Principles, Plays, and Performance. It's 2,500 years of theater in 15 weeks. <laughs> Reading, <coughs> writing, experiencing theater. So I distill it down to just a few units. Okay, that's part one. So two areas of research that are mine. Think about what yours are and how you can apply it to what you do in the course. Part two, how has it influenced the design and the content? 
All right, design. First unit, and I will do this with theater's protest, although I haven't really uh, shaped it completely, is learning about self and learning about self in the community of learners. So I use a lot of different instruments. One is a participatory exercise called compass points. We don't have time for it, but I'll give you the points. And you just raise your hand if you think <coughs> this is you. You have to make a choice. You can only be north, south, east, or west. Okay. If you're north, you're acting. You're the doer. You're the first to demonstrate. You move forward pursuing goals with vigor. You're decisive. If you are south, you're caring. You think of others. You're humble, sensitive, empathetic. If you're east, you're speculating, imaginative, inquisitive. You see multiple possibilities. And if you're West, you're organizing. You're methodical, you pay attention to detail, you're logical and accountable. So imagine, we actually have signs posted more South, East, and West. Everyone has to go stand by their sign. I'm gonna read them and raise your hand if you are, whatever, because I'll tell you, this has been fascinating for me. Sometimes I've been the only person at North, Sometimes there's been only one person at South. North, you're acting. You're the doer first. How many people are North in this room? There. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah, that's funny too. People start to identify each other. <laughs> south, you're caring. You think of others. You're humble, sensitive, and fun. Oh, no. We need to <laughs> uh, yay! Yeah, All right. East, you're speculating, you're an imaginative thinker, inquisitive, you envision multiple possibilities. Uh, okay. And don't be afraid of it, just make a commitment, you know, it's informal. And West, you're organizing, methodical, you pay attention to details. Ah, okay. So a lot of my work is project-based learning. And we use this instrument and a personal inventory, and it's informal, <coughs> about intelligences to form our project-based groups. So guess what? I put together north, south, east, and west so that you have a mix and you work with it. Okay, so the whole first unit is about community, respect, yourself, and this is really, really important because of the project-based learning activities. Understand the way you process information may not be the way someone else does. And you want to find that as an enriching process. Okay, so then <coughs> the rest of the units are about theater. And I have really sort of two mantras. Theater is a harbinger of change and to provoke thought and generate difficult dialogue. And two, the cultural context reflected in theater. Now along with that, the labs are such a phenomenal perk, I think, with UC. So that, you know, we really do focus on experiential activities, and I often bring in folks from the outside. And that's where we do interdisciplinary work. The music and the theater students got together to look at emotional expression through sound. And the SOC students and the theater students got together to look at what is it through the camera, what is it on stage and what is communication. For me, the ultimate goal is critical thinking skills, creative problem solving skills aligned. Okay, so part three, the most fun, the examples. All right, I challenge you to think of different ways of approaching things. Um, we're not there yet. Okay. <laughs> um, the midterm, instead of a normal midterm, and you know, I told you I was a history major, so I'm going over all this data of Greek theater and the theater of the Renaissance and con modern contemporary theater. But then I decided oh, we'll do something slightly different. It's a research base for the midterm, but ask them, and it goes back you know, to your idea of formulating a question. So each small group formulates a question about Shakespeare, and it has to have a sense of Shakespeare then and now. They ask the question, they form a research team, they generate a five to seven page response, then they do what is called the World Cafe, and it is food for thought. So they work in different groups. There is a project leader in each group, who runs the session, it's all peer-based. 
I have guided them to that point, but that whole midterm, they do. And they ask different questions and have food at each station as they explore the results. So, um, let me give you this one. So, one of the questions was, what is Shakespeare's influence on language today? Shakespeare contributed over 3,000 words to our contemporary language, which is kind of extraordinary. So this was the display board. The students sat there and were taught by one another, working with some of the key words, and they enjoyed alphabet soup because the food <laughs> has to go <laughs> along with whatever the display board is. I don't have the display board for the power one, but I'll share the food. Um, they looked at issues of power raised in Shakespeare, and the food, power bars, <coughs> and power aid. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty wild stuff. Um, I'll give you a few more, and then the last one, um, which is really interesting. So you're rotating. As a student, you're rotating around and you're being topic group leaders. So then there was one looking at... You know, basically the question was, what is Shakespeare's influence in literature and cinema? And they took some prime examples, which I thought was pretty wild, because some of these I didn't know. She's the man. I didn't know that. I don't know. They knew that. Um, they looked at Forbidden Planet. Then they actually found roots, like in something like Moby Dick. Um, and then... I'll show you this. This was pretty outrageous. Are the seven deadly sins relevant and how are they reflected in some of the plays of Shakespeare? And the food, this bizarre thing that truly was deadly with chocolate and peanut butter and crackers, etc. And they looked at examples and they have to use citations from text to support their outlook. So they have particular quotes from various plays of Shakespeare as an example. So you get a sense, you move around the room, you have food, and, and it's very specifically um, timed, and my PA was the timekeeper and worked with me to make sure everybody rotated through every station. The group leader stays, that's the only thing, they don't get to rotate, but then we all come back together and share insights. So, that's an example for the midterm. Now I will share the example for the final, because for the final they have to stand solo and literally stand solo. Yeah, so I just have a quick question about the uh -huh. cafe. Was this during the lab period? That no, you did that it? was during the regular the class, class in lieu of the midterm exam. It's time intensive. You can imagine my meeting with each group, the PA meeting with each group, helping them formulate the research question, but it was well worth it. And the feedback I got from the students is, we loved it that our peers could stimulate our thinking, you know, whether they were in the group or they shared the results of the group. Okay, so the final has also two components. The student chooses one of the plays, as I said, from the semester. They work with Aristotle's poetics. We learn them, we do them throughout the semester. Plot, character, thought, music, fiction, spectacle. Say it with me. Plot, character, thought, music, diction, spectacle. Again, plot, character, thought, music, diction, spectacle. One more time. Plot, character, thought, music, diction, spectacle. So they use that rubric to define their interpretation of a play. And then they have to be the director. Now, they don't have budgetary limits. They don't have to deal with copyright limitations, so they can be as imaginative as they would like. And I ask them to consider these four components. And I'll ask you to do this with me. Body. This is a sign for body. Just do it. Body. Make a V and do voice. 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 Do it again. Yes. Voice. voice. One more time. Voice. Let's put them together. Use. Voice. Mind. Mind. That's the sign for knowledge. Mind. <laughs> and then I'll show you the sign I love for imagination. Put your hands up. 
One wrist in front of the other, fingers are closed, and then open it up. Imagine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's put them together. Ready? And you have to use voice. All right, now let's do imagination one more time. Your face has to be expressive. <laughs> Ready? And imagination. So they write a very detailed <laughs> essay using the six components of Aristotle, and they submit that as part of the final. They have two other critical essays as well that are historical. Then they must share. They each have a time, seven minutes, to share visuals and music. And with Aristotle, music is also the melody of the text. In Shakespeare, Ophelia, oh, what a noble mind is here or thrown. Do you hear there is melody and music in that? Um, and then they have to have these visuals and tell us about what they did. So I will share two of the final projects with you, just a little bit of their slides and what they did. Go on, so. Okay. This was one of them. This was taking the idea of death of a salesman. Quintessential American drama about the demise of hopes and dreams. But the student had spent a lot of time working with the Maasai. And she articulated this to, she retitled it, Death of a Maasai Warrior. Do you want to go to the other slides? So she took as a basic looking at plot and thought or theme, the nuclear family, family and the broken family, the image of the Maasai land, the honor of a Maasai warrior, took this particular line from the text, nothing's planted, I don't have a thing in the ground. Looked at the notion because in the play, Willie Loman, who she made Willie Lampaha, um, and Linda, three different wives, she gave them three different names, looking at how important the wife was as a character, and then had various visual symbols. And she had tangible items from uh, the culture, too, for us to hold and connect to as she went through her forward. Then one of the other plays that we covered was for colored girls. And I don't know if you know Natsu's Hanis play. Um, she works with the deconstruction of the language of the privilege and the female's perspective in the midst of that, finding a voice. So the student even took the language itself and called it deconstructed with her own spelling opera. And she starts out with the idea of a 19th century opera house. Her background was primarily music. And the notion of the full costuming. But then she does 10 of the 20 poems that comprise the play. She begins the character singing Bel Canto opera with the full costuming. And throughout the play, as we go through her 10 selected poems, the ensemble shrinks by the end we have an acapella poem and then finally just the spoken word. So we go from the opera in that way with ornate curtains, each section breaking it down by the end. And if you go to the next <coughs> slide, did it go on? There's one more slide. Oh, going from this to the symbol of female power to unitards for the costuming. So we are literally <coughs> deconstructing in content, form, and what we see. All right, great. Now if we can go back to the Good Sense passage, the very first one. So those are two examples. There are other, yeah, one more. There are others that were quite amazing. Um, the student uh, did a very interesting interpretation of Romeo and Juliet. I don't have her slides, Lama Girl, who sits next to her and drums out all of her emotional feelings, which I thought was pretty fascinating. Now, we need the, the lights off for this. All right, so throughout the course of the semester, 
midterm, the most comprehensive project. Final solo responsibility. We do group activities to engender this body, voice, mind, imagination. So I'm going to ask you if you will stand up and learn this Greek choral passage as an example of something we did. Now, after they learned it in English and in classical Greek, they formed small groups, and each group staged it and presented it. You don't have to do that today, but I'm going to ask you to learn the passage. One of the easiest ways to learn is call and response. So I'll do a line as a call. You do it as a response. You repeat it. This is Sophocles and Antigone, 441 BC, translated by Gibbons and Siegel. I'll do the first line. Good sense is the first principle of happiness. Your turn. Good sense is the first principle of happiness. My turn. We must not act disrespectfully toward the gods. We must not act disrespectfully toward the gods. My turn. Grand words of arrogant men. Your turn. Grand words of arrogant men. Paid back with great blows. <gasps> Paid back with great blows. <gasps> In old age. In old age. Teach good sense. <coughs> teach good sense. Okay, before we go back and do it vocally again, and then I'll teach you the underlying words, I will teach you sign language, the physicality for it. Just massage, this is called the bony hand rubber and lower jaw, just massage it. Put the heel of your hands under the lower jaw and breathe down through it. Just pull it down. Drop your chest and shoulders. Drop your hands to your side, have your feet shoulder width apart. Equal weight, foot to foot, toe to heel, shoulders down, chin away from the chest, about a fist length, and focus out. Now, focus, here we go. I'll go, you go, and then we'll do it all together. I'll move it faster. Good sense is the first principle of happiness. Good sense is the first principle of happiness. We must not act disrespectfully toward the gods. We must not act disrespectfully toward the gods. Grand words of arrogant men. Grand words of arrogant men. Paid back with great blows. <gasps> Paid back with great blows. <gasps> In old age. In old age. Teach good sense. Teach good sense. Okay, I'll teach you visual theater, sign language, for the underlined words, and then we'll put it all together and we're done. All right. Sense is the same as mind, the no notion of knowledge. So just kind of do what we did for mind. And the idea is that you're taking it from your thought out. So we would go, good, good sense, sense is the first, first principle, principle of and happiness, open your fingers like this, put them towards <laughs> you, and take the thought from within. Happiness. happiness. You have to smile. Happiness. 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 So it is good sense is the first principle of happiness. Okay, do it and project it. Ready? Go. Good sense is the first principle of happiness. Okay, must not act. It's a little tricky. I'll put my back to you so you get a sense of it. And this is the idea. We won't do it. So you're going to go right, left, right. So clatter hands. Ba, da, da. Right, left, right. So we must, must not act. Right. And drop your hands down disrespectfully toward the... Now, in sign language, there are multiple signs for gods, depending on whatever... Um, particular religion you're dealing with or sect. What we chose was this, the idea of God. It's sort of a universal thing, so let's up and up and focus up. So it's we must, must not act disrespectfully toward the gods. gods. And it has a two part. But <coughs> gods. Okay, we're almost done. Grand words of arrogant. The sign for arrogant is do it. Arrogant. Yeah. 
and you did the right thing. So here we go. Grand words of arrogant men paid back with great blows. And when you do the gasp, if you can do a gesture with it, so it's like this. Pull it in. <coughs> do you feel how it gives you a sense of the gas when you do that? Do that one more time. Ready? Go. <gasps> yes. Great. Okay. In old age, you have a beard. In old age. And you all should learn the signs to teach. It's a wonderful sign. Look up here. Pull it in. And reach out. Teach. And let it go. Teach. And you know the ending. Good. Yes. And when I do that, we work to try to get, and this is fun, we did it in the rotunda of Catson, if you can imagine, creating a stir. So we do teach, good, set, some kind of focus on it, and slowly lift your hands. Okay? Here we go. Ready? Got it? Okay, act your snoop troll feet, shoulder width apart. Take a deep breath. This is the final passage from the chorus of Sophocles and Tiffany. Ready, go. Good sense is the first principle of happiness. We must not act disrespectfully towards the gods. Grand words of arrogant men paid back with great blows. <laughs> In old age, teach good sense. Awesome. So that's an example of the kind of activity we do to prepare them for midterm. And of course, after you've learned all these things, you have great things happening in housing and writing. <laughs> Uh, so Lindsay Weppel is going to talk with us about ways housing and dining can support uh, the classes that are being taught. Thank you. That's quite the act to follow. Um, all right. I'll speak briefly. Um, housing and dining had the opportunity, I know most of you know this, uh, to, for supervising the PAs this fall. That was the first time that we've ever supervised program associates in the university college program. Um, and <clears throat> there have been some interesting discoveries. It's been an experiment fall semester. Um, and some great ways that we've really started to focus, I think, with the PA staff on incorporating the residential component of the University College community has been looking at how we can enhance and really support your learning, uh, what you're teaching in the classroom, the students learning in the classroom content, outside of the classroom on the floor. Um, some of it has been in small ways, and like I said, it's an experiment. So it's really been based off of faculty interest, and then what's kind of the engagement from the students. Um, some successful things we've had, very simple, small things. Um, Understanding Media, Professor Talon has hosted office hours in the community and he's really, he said that those were his most popular office hours. We're having this actually be physically being in the building and having students not have to leave to come talk to him. Um, we've had study sessions. Um, PAs have done a couple things on the floor to really look at helping su to support the students in their classroom learning. So. Um, uh, a college writing class did a write-in. Um, I'm trying to think what else happened. Connor's class did a lot. Um, lots of different interdisciplinary things that we can do in the classroom has been a success. Um, and I'm hoping that next year we can continue to look at opportunities to connect the classroom with the residential component of the course. Not necessarily making it constantly be specifically academic. We can do more casual things as well, but that's been a success. The other major su success and actually a surprise um, has been in supporting students when there's concerns. Um, I'm not sure what familiarity in the room is with the resident director position, but resident directors in housing and dining spend a lot of time trying to understand what's going on with students um, and how we can support students who are experiencing issues. Incl and that may include issues with um, stress, anxieties, mental health issues, uh, uh, up to suicidal ideation or depression. Um, and what's been really awesome about having the PAs in the community is that they can support and understand the academic experiences of students and be really strategic in how we're supporting the students in their success in, um, in the UC community. Um, and so, actually, 
Connor, for example, was a PA for the theater class, um, spent a lot of time in his community understanding what was going on in the classroom and talking to me about this, you know, this is a really challenging subject we're looking at or the students have really had to reach in and do a whole lot that's, and some things are coming up and um, that, n that understanding and awareness of what was going on in the classroom helped us to really engage the students mm -hmm. in their own mental health success later as well. That was a very brief overview. Questions? No, it was, it was a great overview. Let's, well, let's move into some university college statistics. So, Jimmy. So, hi, everyone. Uh, good to see everybody. Um, I'm about to, this is the most obvious part of the presentation. I'm going <laughs> to tell you some of the outcomes that come from students participating in university college. So, uh, would you expect that students that participate in university college uh, came to the second year of college more or less likely than someone that didn't? That didn't participate in university college? More, absolutely. I mean, University College, since its inception, has proven to be a powerful uh, tool for the university to use to, to keep students here. And it's not just for the sake of being here, it's really that sense of connection and, and commitment to the university and to the academic and social experience. In our experience, um, actually nationwide, uh, we tend to look at the university life of students to be um, an academic side and then a social side. And the University College does an excellent job in, in merging those two sides. And that's what we know is that students experience one AU. They don't experience an academic AU and a social AU. It's kind of a merged AU, and UC does a great job with that. Um, I run a survey instrument called MapWorks, and we've been surveying students for about the past three years. What it allows us to do is to check in in week four with how students are doing, and right away we see some dramatic differences in students' perceptions of their time here at, at AU. Um, just to give you a couple ideas, um, students, and this is controlling for some of the factors of students coming in, so high school GPA, kind of racial and ethnic background, that type of thing. Students are less likely to be homesick, less likely to be struggling in more than two classes, less, uh, more likely to return, more likely to think they're going to get their degree here. Um, they are more likely to be, have strong peer connection, identify with people that they like. We ask a very simple question, is there people on campus that you like? And overwhelmingly, the UC students <laughs> like more people on campus than non-UC students. <laughs> um, we ask simple questions about satisfaction with the institution, like would you recommend AU to your friends? Would you come back to AU and choose AU again if you wanted to? And that overwhelmingly is the same too with UC. Um, and this all goes back to UC starts off with the same, UC students start off with the same level of commitment. Uh, UC is the same, uh, UC students have the same uh, consideration of AU as their first choice institution, for example, as non-UC students, but at the end of just four or five weeks, uh, they are more committed, more satisfied, more connected, all that type of stuff. Um, this survey has proved to be very predictive of future success, and so we know that what's happening in those first four or five weeks and what happens throughout that first semester um, has a dramatic impact. And I personally think it has an impact too in the, uh, in, uh, for faculty as well, because to have a community of engaged learners, interested learners, committed learners, and that type of thing, it's just a benefit. And I know um, uh, Bill Davies, who teaches the um, Western legal <coughs> tradition, um, he talks glowingly, and I work with him a bunch on retention stuff, uh, he talks glowingly about that experience, and it's what he writes about when he um, is reflecting on his uh, trying to get tenure here at AU and that type of thing. It's such a strong, um, a part of his experience here that um, I can only imagine that for folks that are interested in doing it or, or um, uh, to get involved, it just can only help in that way. Um, I think that's all I have for now. Anything you'd want me to add or, or speak well, to? Well, I know that um, we've had statistics that talk about risky behavior and yeah. drug and alcohol use and transfers and transports and those kind of things. Where does the UC stand in that in comparison? That's me. To there you go, right there. <laughs> So, um, actually, Housing and Dining looks at statistics with student conduct on student behavior, and overwhelmingly you'll see that we have less issues with um, drugs and alcohol in particular in university college communities in comparison to other first-year communities. Mm -hmm. Statistically, I don't have a fall-to-fall -fall comparison yet, but, um, <coughs> yeah, it's been, a, it's been a trend continuously since the yeah. UC. And when I heard change. that, I mean, just the idea that uh, social in college doesn't have to mean drinking and partying and risky behavior. Social can mean some of this more, I think, productive, healthy type behavior. It's just a kind of reorganization of what, what it means to have a very active and vibrant social life at an institution. So uh, kudos to UC for that. I mean, my job is student success and retention, so it's like autopilot for these, this group of students. It's such a, a great benefit for me um, to be able to point to a really good model on how to run things and do things on campus. Thank you, Jimmy. Yeah. Questions for many of you. You're about to embark as the leaders. 
really the teachers in, in many regards of what's going to be taking place in this new semester. Uh, the students have had a UC course for a semester. Now their professor is still there but really stepped way back where you as the graduate assistant and you as the program associate really get to take over as leaders, as um, teachers, as developers in imparting and thinking about teaching them, okay? And it'll make good sense uh, with everything that you do. It's going to be a phenomenal semester. I thank you for being here today. Know that all Can of I us make are an here. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, this spring, in Care of the Wind, I told you I'm interested in theater to affect change, will be done here on campus at the Greenberg Theater. We are doing a special <laughs> student night only mm. for UC and Gen Ed students and some high school groups. It's $8 for March 26th, but the show runs the 27th through the 30th. I hope that you will come out. There are several UC freshmen who actually got cast in the production. Well, and we'll be promoting it throughout the UC, so that'll be a, a great uh, a great event for us to all try to attend. But um, you've got scholarship, you have these talents, you're learning so much in the last day or two and have had a semester to be thinking about things and will continue to work with us uh, during the semester. And we look forward to a, a great semester and our phenomenal symposium where all of this scholarship and their research is shared on what day? Wednesday, April 2nd, where we invite the world to come see the University College and what these first year students have been able to do and learn under your guidance and leadership. Thank you so much. Great day having you here.